Check out FlipSideGaming.com for all your gaming needs. Use the promo code HEROES to save 10% on all orders over $10 and support the channel at the same time. Hey there, this is John from Heroes and Legends, and welcome to part 5 of our 5-part Guilds of Ravnica limited set review. And today we're going to wrap things up with the Selesnia Guild. Now, if you've been watching the series, you kind of know what to expect here. We're going to go card by card. Today we're focusing on the green cards that do not have watermarks and then all the Selesnia cards that you'll find in the set. So hopefully we'll get you prepared for any limited gameplay you have coming up in the future, whether it's draft, sealed, maybe you're going to the pre-release and you're thinking of choosing Selesnia as your guild. Well, this will definitely be the video you'll want to check out then. Quickly before we get started, just a fast reminder, if you check out the description below, you'll find a few ways to help support what we do here at the channel. Our Patreon page is down there. You're also going to find links to products on Amazon. If you make any purchases on Amazon, once you go through that first link, we'll get a small percentage. Finally, Flipside Gaming is still offering a promo code for our viewers. Hopefully you can save some cash while you support the channel. As always, thank you not only to the folks that look at those links, but to all the viewers. Y'all make the channel what it is. And let's get into today's cards. Affectionate Indrik. This is a cool card. I love the art on this. And this is a fantastic card for sealed or draft as well. Good uncommon pick, high pick, and a draft pack as a matter of fact. Because when you glance at this, a 4-4 four, for four, 6 doesn't sound super exciting, but when it enters the battlefield, it fights a target creature you don't control. So you're in a situation now that you play this, you get the 4-4 four, four body. If it fights a smaller creature, then wonderful. You took out a creature and got a 4-4 four, four on the battlefield. That's a nice swing. But even if it does die in the fight, well, you took out something that was bothering you that you needed to take care of maybe, and you spent 6 mana to do it. That's not the worst thing in the world either. Also, it is a May ability. You don't have to fight if you don't want to. So overall, very good cards. You'll be happy to play this actually in any build. It is splashable too, considering it is only one green. Beast Whisperer. This is a good card as well. Now it's a rare, of course. You won't see this one as much as the previous one. But a 2-3 for 4, I mean, those are okay stats, nothing exciting. But whenever you cast a creature spell, draw a card. That gets insane. Now remember, it's cast creature spell, so Selesnya, if you make tokens or something, that won't count towards it. But whenever you cast a creature spell, being able to draw a card is huge efficiency. This is a major green draw spell, basically. Now, it does have toughness of three, which means it's going to be a little more vulnerable than, say, an enchantment that would do a similar thing. However, if this was an enchantment, they probably would have charged you like five for it or maybe even six. Something like this is going to be maybe weak at times, but you're still getting board presence. And if you're trying to push forward with damage, that's not a bad thing either. But more importantly, the card draw that you could obtain from this is really strong. If your opponent doesn't have an answer for this, they're in trouble. Bounty of Might, another rare that won't show up all the time, but this one's pretty good too. What I like about it simply is the instant speed here. Target creature gets plus three, plus three until end of turn, and then you repeat that two more times. Doesn't have to be three different creatures. That could be the same creature. So if you only have the one creature, you can just give it plus nine, plus nine. Maybe it's a trample creature or something like that. You could get big damage across or you just spread it out if you can, and that might actually be the better idea, just simply because if someone destroys the one creature you throw everything on, then you just kind of lost this, where if you spread it around, it becomes more difficult to deal with. It's just a little conditional. Obviously, if there's just a board sweep and you drew this, it won't feel good, but most of the time it's going to be fine for you. And like I said, the fact that it is an instant is really appealing because you can use it as a combat trick. You could attack in if the creature's not blocked, and now you're getting the extra damage across, up to nine damage. That could be insane if your opponent doesn't play around this. It is six mana. Most of the time, they most likely will play around it, but if they don't, you could get them. And there may be some circumstances where they can't play around it. Circuitous Route. This is a great color fixing card, and the thing you gotta remember is when you sit down and play sealed, especially, but even in draft, most of the time, I don't think you're gonna be in a two color deck. You'll be mostly in two colors, at least a percentage of the time, but you're gonna need at least a splash of a third color, or you might just flat out be playing three colors. For example, instead of going green and white, maybe you end up going green, white, and red, and you're sprinkling some of the Boros mechanics in there as well. That actually could make sense with some of the things Selesny is doing. So cards like this are going to be very, very helpful a good percentage of the time. This one also ramps you a little bit. There's nothing wrong with that. The cards do come into play tapped, but obviously you're getting two extra land drops potentially. So if you did also play a land that turn, that could be three lands. That adds up really quick. Also, you can grab Guild Gates with this, which again is going to go towards fixing, which is very nice. This is a very good limited card, another relatively high pick on common. And we were talking earlier in the week that you might get stuck doing four or five color good stuff type decks. If that's the case, you might pick up some of those cards that are enhanced with Guild Gates. This will help you in that strategy too, if it comes down to it. So this actually is going to be pretty sought after, I think, just generally in a draft or 
if you happen to get this in your seal pool. I do think you play it probably more often than not. Now, maybe you're in a two-color deck and you feel like, okay, most of this deck is pretty mid-rangey. I don't really need the ramp. Perhaps it doesn't make your cut if you're in a more aggressive build or something like that. But most of the time, I think it sees play. Crushing Canopy, this one's a reprint. And this is one of those cards that I typically will sideboard in once I know my opponent has some enchantments or some flyers. But I'll be honest, I wouldn't fault somebody for main decking this. You know, in limited, especially sealed, you're going to run into a flyer at some point, right? Like, that's a lot of times the main way many decks will do their damage. So if you main decked it, I don't think it's the end of the world. Personally, I would probably wait and see what's going on in game one before I bring it in, but it's a very good removal spell, even if it is conditional. Devkaran Dissident. Okay, if you watch my videos, you know what I'm going to say here. I love this card. 2-2 two, two for 2 with upside? Sign me up. Look at it this way. It's good early. It's good late. You need two drops in your curve. It's the most important, most vital part of your curve when it comes to limited. You have to make sure you're getting board presence on turn two and again on turn three. This will do that for you, but also later in the game when that 2-2 two, two for 2 is not that exciting anymore, if you have the mana, you can pump this a little bit. Pump it to a 4-4 four, four if you need to. Maybe even a 6-6 six, six is potentially possible because you could have 10 mana lying around later on in the game if you're kind of in a board stall staring at your opponent. So this is going to be really strong, great curve filler that actually does have some influence on the later portion of the game too. District Guide, another real solid uncommon here, another very high pick. Very similar to Civic Wayfinder, you might remember that card. 2-2 two, two for 3, but when it enters the battlefield, you get to search for a basic land, or in this case, a gate. Reveal it, it goes to your hand. It doesn't go into play, so it's not really ramp, but it is making sure you're hitting your land drops, which is vital. And again, it's another way to fix colors or grab a gate if that's part of your plan. So this is going to be awesome for you. If you can play these, definitely play them. Generous Stray. 1-2 for 3. Okay, that might sound a little underwhelming, but check out the ability. When this enters the battlefield, draw a card. So it replaces itself and yet still gives you board presence. For 3 mana, sign me up. You know what? I realize the 1-2 is small. It might not always have a lot of consequence on the board state. However, I don't care because it's helping me move faster through my deck. I'm moving on to the next thing, and I'm still getting some board presence, even if it's just a chump blocker or something. And remember, Zaznia Colors going wide can be critical. These little 1-1, one, 1-2, one, one, two, two, two creatures eventually could have a big turn if they get pumped, and we'll be looking at spells that do that later. Also, Golgari might not mind having a small expendable creature that will eventually end up in the graveyard for undergrowth. So even a 1-2 is not inconsequential in some of these strategies, but even if you think a 1-2 might not be of much consequence in your deck, don't hesitate to play it just because of the replacement effect. Grappling Sundew. I like this card a lot, actually. Defender, Reach, 0-4 for 2. It gums up the ground, it gums up the air, and also opponents have to really figure out if they need to deal with it, how to deal with it, because for 5 mana, you can make it indestructible till end of turn. Okay, that's kind of sweet. So, it's real hard to deal with. It slows everything down. Why would I want to do that? Well, a couple of reasons. Just generally in green, a lot of times your early plays are about building out small creatures, ramping into your bigger stuff. In Selesnia's case, they may be putting out some small creatures that may not be doing that much, but then later you're tapping them for Convoke. This also was a good thing to tap for Convoke as well, because it only costs two, you get it out early. So when you consider that, you might want to slow things down in those first few turns, especially if you're up against a more aggressive build like Boros or something like that. Now, if you don't main deck this for some reason, then bring it in against those aggressive builds. It's going to be really great for you. Also deals well with flyers if you don't have any other answers for them as well. Not necessarily a first, second, maybe even third pick in a pack, but I'd be happy to pick this up still relatively early in a draft. Hitchclaw Recluse, this one's a reprint, you might be familiar with it. Another card that just slows things down. Really good blocker, 3-drop, 1-4 with reach. It's going to be able to even stop 3-3 three, three flyers. Nothing wrong with that. So if you don't main deck this, remember it's in your sideboard. There might be instances where you need to bring it in to deal with some early flyers or something like that. But just generally, if you need to slow down the game, it could be a good main deck card too. Iron Shell Beetle, this one's a reprint as well. And you know I love 2-2s two for 2. Oh, but wait, this isn't a 2-2 two two for 2. This is a 1-1 one one for 2. But it's actually a 2-2 two two for 2 in disguise. Because when it enters the battlefield, put a plus 1, plus 1 counter on target creature. So that could include this, or it could be something else. I actually like the fact that you can spread around the 2-2 two, two power toughness and not just leave it all on one creature if that helps you out. So that versatility is kind of nice. Yeah, I'm going to play this all day long and love it. And remember, too, in Selesnia, these smaller creatures are kind of nice because not only are they good curve fillers and you need them, but also you could tab them later for Convoke spells, which we'll be getting into all of that in a few moments. Now, even Golgari might appreciate this because if you put the plus one, plus one counter on something else, you got a nice little fragile creature that maybe you chump block with and it goes towards the undergrowth count. 
Nothing wrong with that. Might of the Masses, fantastic reprint here. I love this card. Whenever I get an opportunity to play it in Limited, it was fantastic in Magic Origins. I will play it here, and it could be even better because Celestia has that go wide strategy. There's so much you're getting for just one green mana here. Instant speed, it's just a phenomenal combat trick. It's great defensively, and a lot of times opponents don't play around this because it only costs one green mana. If you only have one green to open, they have to consider that this is a possibility, but many people won't. They'll still run right into it. Also, offensively, if there's a creature that gets by unblocked, one of these small lifelink creatures even, then you could have a really big life swing turn. Now, sometimes this doesn't feel great. If you don't have a lot of creatures, you're behind, you just came out of a board sweep. But again, you're not paying a lot for it. Even a plus one, plus one till end of turn could matter some of the time. You don't have to prioritize this in the first few picks of a draft, but at some point, if you can get a hold of it, it's going to do work for you. Null Hide for Ox. This one's a mythic, so you're not going to see it very often. Is it a good limited card? Sure, of course it is. It's a mythic. It should be. It's weird, though. It's got some strange downsides to it. For four mana, you get a 6-6 six, six Hexproof creature. It doesn't have Trample, but that's okay. For four mana, that's great economy. The problem is there is a drawback. You can't cast non-creature spells. Now, that might not hurt as much, especially in green, but at some point, you're going to want to cast a non-creature spell. Maybe a removal spell, maybe a combat trick, maybe a token generation spell, something along those lines. But you can actually turn that off by paying two mana, but that also turns off the Hexproof. Oh, and also, any player can turn off those abilities. So if they really need to get rid of this thing and they have the mana to do it, two extra mana will take the Hexproof away and they can use the removal spell. On top of all that, if an opponent makes you discard this card, it goes directly into play. That actually could be relevant against some Golgari or Demir builds where you could see some discard effects coming at you. It's a little strange, but again, I think the economy is good enough that I'm still going to play it and take the risk that maybe it doesn't always work out. But a 6-6 six, six on turn 4 is still going to be really good most of the time. Pelt Collector. I love this card. It's a rare. It's not going to show up all that much. But when you get it, play it because it's phenomenal. This is first pickable. It leaves you open on color as well. You could argue that this is best in Golgari because you'll have a lot of high power, low toughness creatures coming and going quickly. And this creature could get large fast. But even if you're just not thinking about that, just play this on turn 1. Turn 2, play a 2-2 two, two for 2. Now this is a 2-2. Two, two. You can even attack in with a 2-2 two, two on the second turn. This feels like a very fast start, right? And later in the game where just a larger creature might not be amazing, this will have trample because once you get to three plus one plus one counters or more, it's going to have trample. That's phenomenal. So a 4-4 four, four would trample, 5-5 five, five would trample, 6-6 six, six would trample. Hopefully it will scale with the game as long as your opponent doesn't take it out. If they do, they're using a removal spell on a one-drop creature. A very good one, albeit, but still a one-drop creature. Great economy when it comes to the give and take of your mana and your resources. This thing is nuts. If you get a chance to play with it, play with it. Portocol is Vine. This is a good common. 0-3 Defender for just one. Best in Selesnia because, again, a one-drop that you can use later to convoke is actually pretty awesome. And then the fact that it gums up the ground. Selesnia wants to make big late game plays. It might have some slow starts, so you need to slow things down a little bit, especially against those aggressive builds, like I've been saying. And also, what's nice is once it doesn't matter anymore, like you don't need this at some point in the game, the 0-3 Defender's not doing a lot, you can just sacrifice it for a card draw if you just pay two mana and tap it. It's not super fast. It's a little slow to get there, but when you get there, wonderful, it's going to replace itself. And if you have other Defenders, you can actually use that ability in them too. That can be relevant at least some of the time. Yeah, you don't need to prioritize this in a draft again. It's a common. These will come up, but if you can grab one for your deck, especially if you have a lot of Convoke, this will be real good. Prey Upon, another reprint here. Classic green removal, though. You just need this. If you're playing green, you need copies of this. It's at common. It will show up. I realize green removal isn't as definite as, say, the removal you'll find in black many times or even the removal that you'll find in white, but this is going to be solid for green. Sorcery speed, sure, and yes, it's dependent on board state, the creatures you have versus the creatures your opponent has, but for one green mana, this is going to be a staple in your green builds. Urban Utopia, good color fixing card here because it allows you to fix your color while it replaces itself at the same time. That's actually pretty awesome. So it's not one of those cards that gives you like two mana when you tap the land that actually ramps you. It's not doing that. But for two, if you need the fixing, play this. You're going to really, really like it. Probably one of the better examples of fixing that you'll find in the set due to the card draw here. Now, if you don't need it, then of course skip it. Vivid Revival, another rare here, so you won't see a ton of it. But if you play with it, I think you're going to be really happy most of the time. I don't think there's going to be any lack of multicolor cards in these decks. 
So eventually later in the game, pulling three of those back to your hand is going to feel really nice. It's actually netting you two cards and you're getting a little selection too for five mana. That feels phenomenal as a matter of fact, even at sorcery speed. Granted, it could be a nombo sometimes with what Golgari's trying to do. Maybe it's a tad bit better in like Selesnia builds or maybe you splash it even in something else. But I don't think it's going to stop you even in Golgari because getting those cards back to your hand, being able to replay them in the late portion of the game could make a huge difference. Wary a copy. Not a big fan of this one. Three casting costs. It's a curve filler if you need it. If I can avoid it, though, I'm going to try to play something else. 3-2 three, for three, even with Vigilance, isn't very impressive to me because many times it's going to trade down with a 2-2. Two, two. If I can find something else, I will. The one positive thing I will say about this is it does have Vigilance, so you could attack with it sometimes and yet still be able to tap it for a Convoke spell. That's kind of narrow, and it takes a very specific circumstance, but occasionally it could happen. Wild Ceratoc. This is a fine curve filler if you need it. Like, nothing crazy, nothing bad about it, though. 4-3 for 4. Those are pretty good stats in Limited, especially Sealed. Like, you won't hate playing this, but I also don't love playing creatures without abilities if I can avoid it. Many, many times you're going to have better things at the 4 spot, but this is still fine if this is what you have. Especially in Sealed, you won't hate this card. Arbitum Elemental as we begin moving into the Selesnia Watermark cards. This has Convoke and Hexproof. You're going to see a lot of Convoke from this point forward. So all the talk about these small creatures helping you out later, not only today, but also when we were looking at Golgari cards, is going to start making sense now because Convoke is a really powerful mechanic. One thing I will warn you about, though, when you get a Convoke card, just don't feel like, oh, you know what? This is always going to be a super early play. Sometimes you might just draw it later, number one. Secondly... Tapping your creatures, you might not always be able to do that. Even though Convoke's awesome, it lets you power up things faster, but tapping a bunch of your creatures, leaving yourself open, isn't always possible. It just depends on board state. So it's not the magic bullet, but it is good. Don't get me wrong. It's a great mechanic. I especially love the fact that you can tap, for example, a green creature, and the green can go towards the casting cost. That's really good. So, yes, I'm going to play with these and be pretty happy with them. Some are going to be better than others, as always. This one's decent, though. You can get this out, obviously, a little bit earlier than a normal 9 drop. The Hexproof makes it hard to deal with. The 5 Toughness means it's a little light. If you attack in with this, it could be blocked with a 3-3 and 2-2, for example. But, you know, is that the worst thing that could happen? 2 for one of your opponent? Nah, not really. So, this is very solid. Maybe it's not like the ultimate win condition in your deck, but it's a good creature. Pex Favor, Instant, Convoke, Combat Trick? Yeah, sign me up. This is going to get a lot of people. You could be completely tapped out when it comes to your mana. Your opponent could attack in thinking you don't have much to do, and then you tap three of your little tokens or something, give something plus three, plus three. could be kind of insane. You can do that in the middle of blocking, too, of course, and still block with those tokens and tap them. Yeah, it's kind of nuts that somebody has to now think about the possibility of this existing even when you have no open mana, but they kind of have to, or else they could get blown out by this. Now, offensively, it's good, too. You could attack in with your stuff, and they block. Now, thinking about this, and then you can go ahead and take out a creature or maybe just push through extra damage if that's what you want to do. On a lifelink creature, that could be a nice swing of another six points. So, yeah, ultimately, I'll play one of these in my deck and be real happy with it. Pause for reflection. Usually, I don't play the fog effects unless I can draft a bunch of them and try to do, like, a turbo fog type thing. But this one's got me interested because of the Convoke. Again, it could be kind of like a free spell. I'm tapped out and I can tap my creatures instead. That might, again, really surprise somebody considering this is at instant speed. So I might actually play one of these and try it out. I'm not completely sold that I'm always going to find a use for it. And I don't like having a dead card in my hand. It's not going to be great necessarily if I'm ahead, for example. But you could get somebody with this here or there. Maybe it's worth running a copy. Siege Worm. All right, one of the best commons in the set. This is a reprint. You might have played with it before. If you did, you know how good it is. It's a Convoke creature. 5-5 five, five stats with Trample. It's that casting cost that makes it so good. Considering it's altogether 7 mana, you Convoke with a couple creatures and play your mana. You get this out pretty quick. You can actually get it out at a point in the game where it's going to be tough to deal with a 5-5 five, five Trample creature. And that's why it's so strong. It's just so quick. It can do so much early damage. And later in the game, it's still not bad either. If you draw it in turn 11, maybe it's not as good but it's still actually a big creature to have on the battlefield and it can still push across damage, especially with a combat trick or a pump spell or something. So it's very relevant throughout the entire game. This is one of those commons that you might even see people first pick in a draft pack. It's that good. Keeps you open on color. It's phenomenal. 
Sprouting Renewal. A lot of flexibility here, and I do like that a lot about the card. It has Convoke, and then you get to choose one, Destroy Target Artifact or Enchantment, which may or may not be relevant at any given time. But if it's not relevant, then okay, I can get a 2-2 creature with Vigilance. It's also green and white with Vigilance, which is great for Convoke because I can get either color out of it, and I can even attack and still use it for Convoke. So yeah, this is a very playable uncommon. Maybe not for second, third, fourth pick necessarily in a pack, but nice middle of the pack pickup. And it's a nice way to deal with a problematic artifact or enchantment without having to wait to sideboard this in for game two, because this is very main deckable. Okay, let's move on to the white cards with the watermarks. Conclave Tribunal. This is a huge removal card for white. It's got Convoke, which is super nice, but even if you don't use Convoke, it only costs four. It's going to be able to target any non-land permanent and opponent controls. And as long as this sticks around, that stays off the battlefield. This is going to be a first pickable uncommon in draft packs if you can get a hold of this and you're in white, or you could even splash this because it's strong enough to be a splashable spell and it does only have one white in the casting cost. This will be fantastic for you if you can use it. Flight of Equinauts. All right, I'm going to play this one too, a 4-5 flyer with Convoke. White and 7, I know that sounds like a lot, but Convoke is going to bring it down a little bit, hopefully most of the time. And even if you play this later in the game, it's still very relevant due to the evasion. Great limited card. Ledev Guardian, eh, I'm not too excited about this one. If I can avoid it, I will. I realize it's a curve filler. Sometimes you will need it if you don't have better things, especially in Sealed. But if I can find something better, I will. 2-4, Convoke for 4. Eh, you've played 2 for 4 before. You know they feel underwhelming. You probably even play 2 fours for 3. They don't always even feel all that great. This at best is most likely a 2-4 for 3, and you're tapping one of your creatures. It's just not doing enough. Loxodon Restorer. This is another kind of average card for me. If you played this, I wouldn't fault you. Maybe it's the best thing you have when you start getting into the higher portion of your curve. It does have Convoke. Hopefully many times you play it for less than six. And when it enters the battlefield, four life is not nothing. But a 3-4 creature, it just doesn't feel like it's quite enough for me. I feel like I'm going to have better cards most of the time. If I don't, I'm not going to be sad to run this. But I think a lot of the times I'd rather just sideboard this in against an aggressive matchup like Boros. I could be taking some early damage. This will help me recoup that a little bit later in the game. Venerated Loxodon. Now this one's a rare, so it's a lot better, and it should be. Now, it's a 5 casting cost 4-4, four, four, but it has Convoke, and when it enters the battlefield, put a plus 1, plus 1 counter on each creature that convoked it. Potentially, not always, but potentially you could be adding 9-9 nine, nine power toughness to the battlefield when you play this creature. That's kind of insane. Won't always happen, obviously, but even if you got 7-7 seven, seven or 6-6, six, six, could be worth it, definitely. So I'll play this and be extremely happy with it when I have it. Camaraderie as we move into the gold cards. Another rare here, but a very good one for Selesnya. Again, Selesnya wants to go wide. We're going to see more token generation in a moment here as we go forward. But gaining X life, drawing X cards, depending on how many creatures you have, is fantastic. Again, if a board sweep just happened, you're behind, it might not feel awesome, but most of the time it's going to be amazing. Also, it gives those creatures plus one, plus one till end of turn, which means this is also maybe a win condition. If you're wide enough and this card comes up, it doesn't even matter about the life and the cards because you might just win the game at that point. For six mana, I'm happy with this. This is a huge card for this particular strategy. Center Peacemaker. This is okay. I think the big attraction here is it's a 3-3 three, three for 3. It gives you 4 life. It also gives your opponent 4 life, so it's reciprocal. I'm not a huge fan of reciprocal effects, but I'm still getting a 3-3 three, three for 3, so I don't want to discount that. The economy's pretty good there. So I would play this more often than not. The reason I wouldn't play it, though, is if I feel like my deck is especially aggressive, I don't want to necessarily give my opponent an edge by giving them life back later in the game. If I'm in these colors, maybe I'm aggressive, maybe I'm not. Perhaps I'm actually playing Boros and Splashing Green. Then I definitely don't want to play this thing, right? But if I'm in a more normal Selesnya deck, I don't think it's going to be that bad. Conclave Cavalier. I love it. This is really good, actually. Little bit tighter on color requirements. Two green and two white, not really splashable for the most part, but 4-4 four, four, Vigilance. So again, you got that whole Vigilance thing with Convoke, which is nice. When this dies, you get two, two, two green and white Elf Knight creature tokens with Vigilance. So again, the Vigilance comes into play, it goes wide, and your opponent, if they deal with this thing, now they have to deal with these two, two tokens that just kind of split in half. Kind of amazing and limited. Really high pick on common, maybe first pickable in many packs. The only reason I would try to shy away from first picking it in pack one is the strict color requirement, though. Conclave Guild Mage. You know I love the Guild Mages. You know what I'm going to say here, right? If you've been watching these videos, first pickable, maybe, as long as I'm comfortable starting to commit to colors. But even so, these are splashable. 
You get a 2-2 for 2, even if it's maybe more of a turn 3 play sometimes because it is on color. But look at those abilities. Yes, yeah, skill mages are a little slow. Like, you have to untap with them. They could die in the meantime. But once you get there, the abilities are good. This one, no exception. Green and tap. Creatures you control gain trample until end of turn. That could win you a game, get you past the board stop, potentially. The white ability, even though it's more expensive for a white and five, you get another one of these 2-2 Vigilance green-white tokens. Great for Convoke, great for building out your board state. If you are in the board stall and the trample isn't going to help you win, you just keep making a creature every turn. You just stay ahead of the curve, and eventually you're going to overwhelm your opponent. This is awesome. Amerisol of the Accord. I love these two twos for two. I'm a sucker for them. This one, again... I get decent board presence, and on top of it, whenever it's tapped, I get to create a 1-1 white soldier creature token with lifelink this time. So a little different, but you know what? I don't have to just attack to tap this. I could convoke with this. It gives me green or white when it comes to colors, and I create a token out of it, which I can convoke with as well. Feels like the start of an engine, right? This is another really strong Selesnia card. Join Shields. You want one of these if you're playing Selesnya. It's a solid card that could surprise your opponent at times. Let's say I convoke with a bunch of stuff and my opponent thinks I overcommitted. They attack in. I play this on tap. My things are indestructible and hexproof till end of turn. And then I can block and really surprise them. That's kind of awesome. Or maybe my opponent has a board sweep. I can protect my creatures. Maybe they're going to use pinpoint removal on a creature that I really care about. The hexproof comes into play. Or I simply attack in with everything, do some damage. And then again, it looks like I overcommitted. My opponent thinks they're going to crack back. Surprise, I got this. This is going to be really good in a lot of different situations. Knight of Autumn. I love this card. It's a rare. You're not going to see it all the time, but if you can, play with it. First, it's a 2-1 for 3, but it kind of feels like a Reclamation Sage because when it enters the battlefield, you get to choose one of those things. One of those options is to destroy target artifact or enchantment. Again, a way to do it that is very main deckable. Or you can gain four life, so maybe you were getting beat down early on by that Boros deck and you need to recover some life. It has that option on there. Or simply, it just comes in as a 4-3 for three, 3, which is awesome too. Yeah, this card is amazing. Ledeb Champion. Here's another potentially first pick on common for you in draft. It's only a 2-2 two, two for 3, but it's a mana sink. White, green, and 3 create a 1-1 one, one white soldier creature token with lifelink. Great for convoke. The lifelink can be very relevant with these pump spells and such. And just using this mana sink to keep building out your board state, especially in a stall, is going to be phenomenal. On top of that, whenever this attacks, you may tap any number of untapped creatures you control, and this will get plus one, plus one to land a turn for each creature tapped this way. So it also does something Selesnia hasn't done a whole lot of yet, and that's go tall. So if you need to go tall, this is a way to do it. It doesn't have trample or anything, but that could still be relevant from time to time. I really play this, though, for that second ability more than anything. March of the Multitudes. All right, this one's a mythic. You won't see it a whole lot, but if you can play with it and you're in these colors, go for it. It's too white, makes it a little hard to splash, but only one green and X, but it has Convoke. Create X 1-1 one, one white soldier creature tokens with lifelink. That could be a lot of lifelink creatures, potentially. And what's nice about this card is, again, it's another way to just pull ahead to the point where maybe you can win a game on the next turn or something like that. It's at instant speed, so you can do it as a combat trick, or you can just wait till the end of your opponent's turn to do it so they don't know what's coming. Or you could just simply play this even if you're behind a little bit, make a couple chump blockers with lifelink and try to hang on until you get your next big spell. That's something you hopefully won't have to do, but maybe you will utilize the card in that way sometimes. So it's going to be a strong card, many times leading to a big play. Rosemain Centaur. All right, this is a solid Convoke card. It has Vigilance. Again, we talked about how that works well with Convoke. 4-4 four, four for 5 with Convoke. Good economy there. Even if you played this just for 5 mana, it's still a pretty good card. 4-4 four, four, Vigilance. If you can knock down that cost a little bit here or there, then wonderful. And again, like I said before, Convoke isn't the be-all, end-all. A lot of times, maybe you would have attacked in with those creatures instead of tapping them for Convoke. Or sometimes you just need them as blockers and you can't play this early. But still, having the option is always nice. This is a very good common that you'll be able to find later in a pack and draft, and so they'll be plentiful enough and sealed. Samala Woodshaper, another really strong common here. 2-1 for 4. It gives you board presence no matter what happens. Could you miss with it? Yeah, you could, but you're looking for enchantment or creature, so hopefully, most of the time, you're going to hit something, at least a creature. Is it always a consequential creature? Maybe not, but it's still giving you a replacement card and a little selection, too. I kind of wish that the cards went to the graveyard instead of bottom of the library. That would be nice if I wanted to splash this in Golgari, for example, but again, I'm not going to complain about that. The card is very solid. Tristani Discordant. 
Here's another mythic, and this one's kind of nuts. One four for five. Other creatures you control get plus one plus one. When this enters the battlefield, create two one one white soldier creature tokens with lifelink. So not counting any other creatures that you could have on the battlefield. If you just played this in a vacuum, you're going to be getting five eight power toughness on the battlefield for five. All right, that's really good. And then I get an anthem effect for my other stuff to boot, so it could be more. Oh, and by the way, at the beginning of your end step, each player gains control of all creatures they own. And there's actually some ways to steal creatures in this set, so maybe every once in a while that's relevant. But even if it's not, who cares? Because this is amazing. Anthem effects are always going to be awesome for you. Obviously, Slesnia is trying to go wide, so pumping all your creatures could even be game-ending sometimes. This would be really good in Boros, too, if I just splashed a little green, because Boros would really love an Anthem effect as well. World Soul Colossus is pretty good if you go all in on the Selesnia plan. There are definitely times where this could be a large creature. It doesn't have Trample. It doesn't have Evasion, unfortunately. But, you know, in Sealed or Draft, sometimes just having a big old creature is good enough if the opponent doesn't have answers for it. So I'll play this and be happy with it. One in my deck would suffice. This doesn't have to be a high draft pick uncommon, necessarily. You might be able to get this in the middle of the pack. Vernadi Shield Mate. Here's our hybrid card. 2-2 two -two Vigilance. So again, kind of plays into the whole Convoke thing. But it does have flexibility being hybrid. So could you play this in Golgari if you needed to as a curve filler? Sure, it's a great curve filler. 2-2 two -two for 2 with upside. You know how I feel about that. Also, this could be fine in Borhos sometimes if you're just scrapping for some smaller creatures that could be mentored. The Vigilance is kind of interesting. So very solid common again. First split card with a Sure and Assemble. I love that the first side of these splits are also hybrids. It gives you a little flexibility when it comes to where you play these. But the Assure is okay. It's like an interesting combat trick, but giving something indestructible till end of turn, even if you're not using this defensively in combat, could be good if someone's trying to use pinpoint removal on a key creature or something like that. Very cheap to pull off. Your opponent could be surprised at times. And again, it fits into not just Celesnia, but any build that can swing the colors. Now, Assemble's a little stricter with a white, green, and four. Create three 2-2 two -two green, white, elf, knight. Creature tokens with Vigilance. Again, probably best for Celesnia, obviously, but splashable. You're still getting 6-6 six, six power and toughness on the battlefield for just simply 6 mana. That's really not that bad. Maybe you could even splash a little green in a Boros deck every once in a while and play both sides of this card. At times, either one could be relevant. Flower Flourish. Okay, the first side flower is another way to try to make sure you hit your land drops or color fix. If that's important to me, then I'm going to play this. And in a pinch, if I'm just in a Selesnya deck and I'm playing this more for Flourish, but I really need to make sure I hit a Forester Plains early on, then Flower is going to help me out. Maybe I'm going to sacrifice the second half of the card for the first. Okay, sure, it's fine there. Where this might be a little better, though, is if I'm trying to splash one of the other colors. For example, I'm playing Golgari colors with a little bit of white, or I'm playing Boros with a little bit of green. Then in that case, this is going to become stronger. Now the Flourish side, a little more strict, of course, white, green, and four. Sorcery speed, creatures you control get plus two, plus two until end of turn. So you can't use it as a combat trick, but you know what? This is going to be one of those game-ending cards. It's going to be good for Selesnia because you're trying to go wide. You have the lifelink tokens and such. This could be a huge play for you and perhaps shuts the door on the game. Boros would like this too. Splash a little green and you could get there with your Boros build because later in the game, if they're running out of gas and they need one more big push, this could give it to them. Really solid card, actually. All right, time for the one artifact, Selesnia Locket. Now, we've talked about these all week, so I won't say a whole lot about it. Again, these are a little better probably if I'm trying to splash one or the other colors as opposed to just running this strictly in a Selesnia deck. But it's still good there. It gives you a little ramp. It does help smooth out your color a little bit. And my favorite part, when you don't need it anymore, pay for, sacrifice. It replaces itself. Go a card deeper. Nothing wrong with that. Here's the two copies of Selesnia Guildgate. You're probably familiar with this card from the past. Yes, again, I love these, especially if I'm trying to splash one or the other colors. Maybe I end up on the plan to draft four or five color good stuff. Then, of course, Guild Gates will become very important. But again, I would just play this in a Selesnia build. Selesnia slowed down the least by Guild Gates because they have Convokes. There's nothing wrong with throwing some of these in for color fixing consistency purposes. Another famous card, one of the Shocklands Temple Garden. And much like the Guild Gates, if you choose to have this enter the battlefield tapped, it's not going to slow you down all that much within Selesnia. So it's a nice card for consistency purposes. Better, though, if you're playing a different build and you're splashing one of these two colors, definitely. Here you have the added bonus that if you don't want it to come into play tapped, you just take two damage, and it won't. That's kind of nice if you need to speed along. However, I have been warning this week, be careful if you're up against Boros, maybe another aggressive build. You don't want to do them any favors by shocking yourself sometimes. So just consider that as you play. 
All right, with that being said, that concludes the Guilds of Ravnica limited set review. So I hope this is helpful to you, maybe gives you a little bit of an edge going into drafts and sealed in the future, or if you're going to the pre-release this weekend. Now, tomorrow we're going to be back with the pre-release primer, as a matter of fact. A lot of people have asked me, what guild do I think is the best? What would I play? We'll talk about that in tomorrow's primer. We're also going to give a lot of tips for people who maybe have never gone to a pre-release before, so you know what to expect, what to bring, that type of thing. Later in the week, we're also going to do a Guilds of Ravnica Market Watch, so you know the value of the cards you're going to be opening this weekend. But until next time, hey, thanks for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe, and have a great day. Hey, thanks for watching. This video is made possible by the generous support of viewers like you on Patreon. Check out the description below for links to our Patreon page as well as our Amazon affiliate store, where a small percentage of all sales will also help support the channel. Finally, if you haven't had a chance yet to subscribe, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any new videos on Heroes and Legends. Talk to you again soon, and have a great day.